there are some groups that are shrouded in mystery, but none more so than that of the Knights Templar, who were a group of people whose very real history has slowly been turned into the stuff of myths and legend, whose very real history has been altered by time, memory, and its depiction in the cinematic universe of Hollywood. Do they still exist? It's doubtful, but perhaps. It seems, though, we are more interested in the bits that are unknown to us and allow our imagination to run wild. But here on this channel, we stick to the facts. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, go ahead and hit that like button and that subscribe button. I would appreciate it. If you are subscribed already, welcome back. Today we are going to be talking about the Holy Order of the Knights Templar, who through crusades helped conquer the Holy Land of Jerusalem. They also created a safe passageway for pilgrims and created the world's first international banks, whose history is shrouded in a white cloak of legend from a new world order to the Holy Grail. As always, like, comment, and subscribe. Now, this is part number one of five parts of the Knights Templar. Let's get into it. Now, we do know quite a lot about the Knights Templar, but we don't know everything about them. They are linked to the bloodline of Jesus Christ, the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, and we do know that they were indeed feared by their enemies and eventually the church itself. But we in the 21st century are so intrigued by the Knights Templar, some 700 years after their demise, whose real name is actually the poor fellow soldiers of Christ of the Temple of Solomon, not even the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar is a shorthand for that long name. But what is very strange is they were definitely not the only group of knights in the Holy Land at that time. There were the Teutonic Knights, the Knights of Malta, the Knights Hospitaller, among many, many more. The Knights Templar were a Christian military order who came into being in 1119. But they officially came into international being when Pope Innocent II recognized them in a papal bull in 1137, 20 years after their initial recognition. But what did the Pope actually recognize him to do? Well, as Christianity spread throughout medieval Europe, Christians wanted the Holy Land of Jerusalem because that is where Jesus Christ died. And the lands around Jerusalem, as there are lots of places that are mentioned in the Bible, but they were all held by either Muslims or Jewish people. Hence, they launched a holy war called the Crusades. Now, they didn't only launch one or two Crusades, but eight in total. Perhaps it even may be a good idea to have a video of the Crusades in the future. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Anyway, it's here where we need to start our story, at the Crusades. Before the Knights Templar were even around in 1096 AD, Pope Urban II called upon the high aristocracy of Europe across Europe, not just in one place, to take the Holy Land of Jerusalem and with cries of Des Levolt, God wills it, they accepted it and they set off across the First Crusade. And it was under a number of different leaders that they would find success, but only one of these leaders would eventually capture Jerusalem itself. When the Crusaders breached the heavily armed walls on the 15th of July, 1099, their leader was of course the legendary Godfrey of Bouillon, a bullish man, who ordered the slaughter of everyone in the city, no matter what race, gender, age, or religion, he would eventually, a year later, die as the ruler of the city, and his brother and heir, Baldwin I of Jerusalem, made himself king. This is the first crusade, and is actually the only successful crusade. Jerusalem was made a kingdom, and it had been taken for a purpose, so that Christians could protect the Holy Land, and people across Europe could come and see the holy sites that are mentioned in the Bible. But do these people need to travel long distances? 
Yes, of course they do. They're coming from Europe. There's no aeroplanes. They had to go with horses or with a boat. So it was a really long voyage and the pilgrim was quite difficult. This is the 12th century. There were no credit cards. There were no banknotes. These people had to travel with money, gold and silver coins, which made them irresistible to thieves who in this era in the Holy Land were mainly Muslims who had been kicked out of their home. A small group of Crusader Knights decided it was their divine calling to start to protect their fellow Christians from attacks on the roads leading up to Jerusalem and to protect the city itself. By 1118, the Crusader Knights elected a new king after Baldwin I's death, his cousin, a Frenchman and nobleman who called himself Baldwin II of Jerusalem. In 1119, another Frenchman, who de Pont, who was a knight in the crusade, approached the new king with eight of his fellow knights. And they had all been protecting the roads that led up to Jerusalem. And they explained to the new king what they had been doing. Baldwin II liked this idea. And he made Hu de Pont a grand master of the Masonic order, which means that he is the head of the order, the president, the leader, whatever you want to call it. The heads of knightly orders are called grand masters, even today. So technically, even Queen Elizabeth II is a grand master as well. Anyway, with this act, Baldwin II birthed the order of the Knights Templar through royal decree. Baldwin II also offered them accommodation within the Temple Mount, which is where they get their name. At this early stage, very little is known about the Knights. But it is known that they live a life devoted to God. They are like monks, but they are finely trained, fearsome warriors. They pray many times a day, are dressed in humble clothing, refrain from eating too much, perhaps I could learn from them in this sense, and rely on charitable donations to get by. Their logo, if you will, is actually of two knights sharing a horse to emphasize their poverty. The Grand Master Hu de Pont had aspirations for the small group of knights. And over the next 10 years, he traveled across the Holy Land and even to Europe to entice others to join his holy order. And in 1128, he made his way to the island of England and Scotland, where he set up Templar outposts in Edinburgh and London, and they are known as commandries. You can even go see them today. They even make an appearance in Dan Brown's fictional but rather entertaining book, The Da Vinci Code. On his travels, Grand Master Hu de Pont organized the Council of Troyes in France. And although his order had royal decree from the King of Jerusalem, Hu de Pont wanted a little bit more. He wanted the highest power to recognize his order, a papal blessing. Although Pope Honorus II didn't attend, he sent a papal legate, Matthew, Cardinal Bishop of Albano. This council was attended by many great clerics all over France, and well, Hugh de Pont brought five of his knights with him. He knew he needed a trump card to get everyone on his side. So what they did before the council is they developed a code of conduct, which would later become known as the Latin Rule. It consists of 72 clauses which define in great detail what knights can expect from the order and perhaps more importantly what the order expects from the knights in return. Now this code of conduct, the Latin rule, includes phrases like brothers be granted three horses and a squire who may not be beaten if he pays charity. The brothers may be granted white cloaks which symbolize both their purity and their chastity. The white cloaks in time will eventually include a red cross as well. The knights may not adorn themselves in lavish clothing or attempt to improve their cloaks. Brothers should avoid wicked laughter and idle words. Brothers may not recount deeds they have done in the past in a boastful manner. Now, so far, this Latin rule code of conduct seems rather honorable, but here it gets a little bit more old school. There will be no females to enter the house of the Templar so that the flower of chastity is maintained among brothers and that brothers should avoid any 
woman's embrace, as brothers will perish in the embrace of females. In general, we can see that these vows are actually quite similar to most religious monks. But these monks are kind of different, especially for one reason. They are expected to fight. The issue is that they are religious men and Christians, and they may not kill. So the Council of Troyes in France decided they needed to have a debate and determine how the Knights Templar could get around this rule and what constitutes them being allowed to kill. It was declared and decided that they could only fight and kill if they had orders from a higher power, a bishop, a cardinal, an anointed king, or the Pope himself. And with a clerical signature, the bull is recognized and the order is recognized. With this recognition from the papacy, Hu de Pont, the Grand Master, sets off once again to gain new brothers to be knighted into his order. And its ranks doubled in size and then tripled in size. And it became a multinational and international organization with thousands of knights. With all these knights coming in, each one swears a vow of poverty. But the order itself becomes increasingly wealthy. Now, how on earth did these warrior monks gain all this wealth? Well, they went to nobles around Europe and explained who they were and what they did. And the nobles decided to donate arms and money and castles and palaces. But most importantly, they donated land. The knights turned this land into farms to make crops and vineyards to make wine, all to sell so they could make money. They also got taxes from the local governments. So they weren't just making a little bit of money to put some food on their table. They were making Jeff Bezos amounts of money. The man who made this happen, Hugh de Pont, at the age of 66 in 1136 passed away and his title of Grand Master passed to Robert Dionon. For the next 11 years, Robert, another Frenchman, as the Grand Master convinced Pope Innocent II on March 29th, 1139 to issue the bull of Omne Datum Optimum. In English, it means every perfect gift. This bull exempted the order from ecclesiastical judgment, and made them completely independent. The Templars were also granted the habit with the Red Cross that we know so well today. It also offered them substantial financial backing and exempt them from paying any local taxes as they were also granted the most important thing. They could keep any spoils of war in the Holy Land. With this bill, the Knights grew from strength to strength, gaining more influence and power wherever they went. Even nearly 60 years after the bull, King Alfonso II of Aragon in Spain, who was a close friend of King Richard the Lionheart of England, who was pinnacle in the Crusades and so on, he offered the Knights Templar on his deathbed in 1196 a third of his entire kingdom. As they grew, the Knights Templar became a military force to be reckoned with, and they became an economic powerhouse. Find out more in part number two of five. I really hope you enjoyed that. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you want to watch in the future. Like, comment, subscribe, the more you know.